Hello, and welcome to another episode of Boundless Body Radio. I am your co-host, Casey Ruff, here with my other co-host, Bethany Ruff. Bethany, welcome to the show. Hello, hello. You usually can't make it. You're too busy all the time. Made exception today. Good awesome. combo. Awesome. Um, are, this might be a record for salt jokes. Do you have any good salt jokes? We'll get uh, salted. Uh, no, I'm really salty that I don't. Uh, <laughs> we have a great um, episode for you today. Let me introduce our guest, Daryl Bouchard is an expert on the topic of all things salt. Daryl grew up working for the family mineral business right here in Utah in a town called Redmond. He earned his bachelor's degree at SUU, then earned his MBA at Western Governors University. He has the gift to be able to share the science behind salt, why it's an essential nutrient, and why a low salt diet may not be as healthy as we've been told. Daryl is passionate about healthy living, healthy eating, and lifelong learning. We are grateful that he was willing to share his wisdom with us today. Daryl, it's a pleasure. Welcome to the show. Casey, Bethany, thanks so much for having me. I'm super excited to be on your program and hopefully dispel uh, or get rid of some of the salt myths out there. Absolutely. This is one of our favorite topics, something we really love to learn about, and we're just so honored that you would uh, show up. Um, I have to say, there's, um, there's a skit from the Dave Chappelle show that most people are pretty familiar with. And it, you know, the meme that comes along with it where he's a crackhead and he's kind of itching himself and he's got drugs all over him. And I have to say, when I was working at a gym, I had a bit of a reputation and about once a week, somebody would come up to me and be like, Hey, do you have the, do you have this stuff? And I'd be like, yeah, I've got the stuff. And I'd walk over to my drawer and I'd take out a vial of white looking powder, except I wasn't dealing drugs. I was giving them little, little shots of salt. People were realizing that if they were feeling low energy or they were feeling lightheaded, they would come to me and I had the reputation that I was the salt guy and I was going to give them a little bit of salt and almost instantly they would feel better. <laughs> Can you explain why that would be? Yeah, you know, you know, our bodies are basically saline solution in motion. In importance of minerals, we have air, oxygen, we have water, and then we have salt. And we absolutely have to have all three of those or the body starts to shut down. And in the gym, particularly, you know, if if you're in the gym, you're working hard, you're sweating. If you've ever noticed your tears are salty, as you know, our sweat is salt. I wouldn't recommend licking your arm at the gym, but your sweat is going to taste salty and your urine is salty because our bodies are saline solution in motion. So we have to have these salts in our body because all of our body fluid is based in salt. And so as those salt levels start to drop, the body starts to shut down. Just like as your oxygen levels drop, your body will shut down. As your water levels drop, your body will start to shut down. And as your salt level drops, your body will start to shut down. And that's why in a gym setting, or if you're a firefighter, if you're a bike rider, if you're a roofer and you're out in the hot sun, or even just gardening in your backyard, we absolutely have to elevate the importance of salt. And salt isn't this, this white chemical poison that we need to get rid of. There, there is a white chemical poison we should get rid of, our, get rid of in our diets, but that's not salt, that's sugar. Mm. Yeah, I love that. We used to have a phrase that we would say, like it's in the Bible where we'd say that people are the salt of the earth. And you don't really hear that anymore. And I'm wondering if it's because you, you, you just mentioned like all the benefits of salt, but if you eat salt, you're going to die. So maybe like in, in 2021, if I tell somebody they're the salt of the earth, I'm going to tell them that their heart's going to blow up and they're going to have high blood pressure and they're going to die. <laughs> um, it, it, why in the world is it so ubiquitous that everybody just knows that salt is bad for you and is going to make your blood pressure go up? That's a really fun topic. And if we go back even a little bit further, you know, you mentioned, um, you know, this idea of salt of the earth, but salt has always been a super important um, element and spice. And every civilization, you know, started around access to the salt deposits because salt was so necessary for life and for animals and a source of trade. And if you look at almost any religious book, it talks about salt, about the salt of the earth and, and contaminated salt. Salt was used as religious in religious ceremonies. It was used as a wedding gift. In fact, if we go back to the times of Rome, the, the phrase, is a man worth his salt? It's one you may have heard of before. That idea was because the Roman soldiers were paid a salary, which is also based on the word salt. They were paid in salt because it was, tra- it was a good you know, source of trade. 
And if you weren't working hard and contributing, you weren't worth the salt that you were paid. So this idea is a man worth his salt was if you were getting paid in salt and you weren't earning your keep, you weren't worth your salt. And so there's all of these little fun glimpses into the history of salt that impact us today, even you know, like your statement, the salt of the earth. And yet now, like you said, you've heard that salt's bad. Now, if we back up, you know, before the turn of the century, before the invention of the refrigerator, all of us would have eaten as much or more salt because our foods would have all been preserved in salt. You know, in the off season, if we had, you know, any type of meat, it would have had to have been preserved in salt. If we had kimchi, sauerkraut, pickles, all of that would have been preserved in salt. And yet we didn't have all of these health problems that were later in the 19, between the 30s and 70s, kind of attributed to salt. It wasn't the salt that was the problem. It was one, the nature of salt changed. And two, it was all the crappy foods that the salt was getting put on. Mm. Yeah, I think that's so critically important. I think a lot of people have cravings for salt because they're not getting enough, and so they they turn to the potato chips. Is that right? Yeah, and and sugar as well. You know, our our bodies are pretty intuitive. When we get thirsty, um, we have a craving for water, and oftentimes most of us don't listen to that, and we go around way too dehydrated. Um, and our bodies will crave fat, and so as our bodies start to crave things, our diets today have associated that with certain foods. So as we're craving salt, we're not craving, you know, potato chips or French fries or, you know, things like that. It's actually the salt that our body's craving. And so as we get better about listening to our bodies and we focus on the nutrient and not the crappy food that sometimes we associate, then our nutrition is going to be a lot better. And what's kind of fun about salt is the salt craving is often misunderstood for sugar. So if you have, you know, if you're craving sugar, what you're, you think you're craving sugar, what you can do is take a little salt crystal and put it under your tongue. And you'll find that oftentimes that will satisfy that sweet craving. And salt itself, if it's a natural salt crystal, actually has a sweet flavor to it. Um, it's only the, the processed chemicalized salt that has that bitter, you know, that yucky salt taste. Um, salt should have a very natural sweet taste, especially if we're a little bit low on our sodium. Mm. Interesting. So before we go any further, let's just establish, does salt make your blood pressure go up? There are, so that's a little complicated. There are some people that are salt sensitive. It's a very small part of the population, but just like you have people that are sensitive to even water or, you know, whatever. So there is a small percentage of the population that's salt sensitive, but it's much smaller percentage than we than we think. And the second thing is there is, you know, very small impacts of blood pressure and sodium content. But what's more important is these other electrolytes. The American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, it's an article I think we're going to maybe put a link to um, as part of this podcast, really highlights the fact that it's not the sodium, it's the sodium's interaction with potassium, magnesium, calcium, chloride, these other complex chlorides that offset the sodium that have the bigger impact on blood pressure. So it's not the sodium itself. In fact, there's an American Journal of Medicine article now that states that you can have individuals consuming high amounts of sodium or low amounts of sodium, and they can fall into a high blood pressure or a low blood pressure group, depending on if they're consuming adequate amounts of calcium, potassium, magnesium, these other electrolytes. Now, what's kind of interesting about that particular discussion is if we go back to the way salt has always been, you know, before the kind of industrialized revolution, seawater and salt occurs as a complex chloride. So if we went back into the, you know, 1700s and we're going to get salt, we can get it from a few different ways. We can go out to the ocean. The ocean has potassium or has sodium chloride in it. It's predominantly sodium chloride, but it also has calcium chloride, potassium chloride, magnesium chloride, trace amounts of iodine. That's why you know, seaweed and kelp and fish are rich in iodine. So seawater doesn't occur as pure sodium chloride. So as we were to create salt or harvest salt from the ocean, you know, back in the 1700s, what we would do is we would pull the water off the ocean. It occurs two to 3% salt. We would put it in a pond and line that pond with either a gray clay or a, a membrane to, so the water doesn't seep out into the ground. And then as the sun evaporates the water off, the salt goes from 
salt content goes from 3% sodium chloride or 3% salt to four to five to six. At 26% sodium and chloride, that's what we call max salinity, meaning the water can't hold any more salt in suspension. And so then as the water continues to evaporate, the salt falls out of suspension and settles on that pond. And that's how we would harvest salt. So we would get all of the, the complete complex of minerals in the salt water, mostly sodium chloride with potassium, calcium, magnesium, um, you know, trace amounts of selenium, zinc, copper, phosphorus, iodine, all of these natural minerals that occur in seawater. Or we could get that same type of salt from an ancient seabed or from a, from a dead sea. Those are the three types of, of locations. And so like the, the Himalayan pink salt, that salt comes out of Pakistan, it's been mined for, for centuries. And that's an ancient seabed, geologists say is around the Jurassic era, that's been pushed up into a, into a salt pillar that's harvested there in the Himalayan Pakistan region. In Utah, there's a very similar deposit. It was laid down during the Jurassic era, and this salt has been pushed up near the town of Redmond. It's sold under the brand of Redmond Real Salt. And it's this ancient seabed that was laid down during the Jurassic era, and it has all those minerals and elements intact. Now, at the turn of the century, salt companies started to realize a couple of things. One, these other minerals in seawater are valuable. So they could move the seawater through a series of evaporation ponds with a different liner in the bottom, and they could leach off the potassium chloride, leach off the magnesium chloride, leach off the calcium chloride, and now you still have salt, but you've kind of changed the structure. It'd be like if I took an orange, you know, it's rich in ascorbic acid and vitamin C complexes. And if I pulled the ascorbic acid out of the orange and then I sold you the orange that's left, that's not the same thing as an orange that's complete. You know, same thing with milk. You know, if you look at milk, the real nutrition value in milk is in the fats. And so if I'm a farmer and I can take that milk and I can pull off the fat and I can sell the fat for, for cream or for butter or for whatever, and then I can sell the leftover white substance as milk, then I've really, you know, kind of taken that milk and the dollars from that milk as a farmer made it go further. And salt companies started to do that same thing, which is a bit of a challenge. As you know, as we just talked about the importance of that sodium potassium pump and the other electrolytes working with sodium to offset the sodium. So you start pulling it apart and it doesn't work, you know, quite the same. The other challenge is salt is hygroscopic. That's a word that means basically a dehumidifier. So if I have a salt crystal and we put it on the kitchen table in a real humid area, let's say Florida or the Gulf of Mexico, um, and we have this salt crystal, it's going to start sucking water out of the air. And by the afternoon, you're going to have a little pool of water under the salt crystal because salt's job is to absorb and impact moisture. That's why in the body, it's so critical in balancing the intercellular and extracellular fluids because of the way salt interacts with moisture. But we, salt companies, you know, one of the, one of the um, interesting things about salt is if you have salt in a shaker on a humid day, because it has a tendency to absorb moisture, the salt gets sticky. So if you've ever been to, to Florida or to Hawaii or to anywhere humid and you have a shaker of salt that's natural, it's going to start clumping together. Well, Salt companies thought, hey, this might be a problem. And instead of saying, hey, let's put some rice in the salt crystals or let's do something else to help absorb the moisture, they went to, to, to science and chemicals and said, what type of chemicals can we add to salt to stop its ability of attracting moisture? And they came up with a whole list of them that worked. Things like yellow preciative soda, sodium ferrocyanide, calcium silicoaluminate. Um, and these other chemicals that can be tricalcium phosphate that can be added to the salt crystal that stops the salt crystal's ability to absorb moisture, which then stops the salt from getting clumpy in your shaker. And there was a tagline that said, when it rains, it pours. And it had a little uh, picture of a girl with a salt shaker and an umbrella and it's raining and the salt is pouring out of the shaker, even though it's a downpour. And that's why it's because there were chemicals they were adding to the salt to stop the salt's ability to interact with moisture. The problem with that is salt's job in the body is to interact with moisture. So if we were to take two licks of our antiperspirant before breakfast, you're going to have some water retention, some blood pressure, and all kinds of problems because that's not the way the body's supposed to work. And so with salt, you've got the lack of 
the, the minerals that occur with the salt, and then you start adding chemicals to the salt, and then it's no wonder. And then you put that, that demineralized and processed salt on crappy processed foods, and we all of a sudden wonder why we're having health problems. It's just another case of us making a problem, trying to make some money, and inventing a solution when this is just so natural and something we've had our, for our entire evolution. It's, it was such a crazy story. You did such a good job highlighting that. How does, how does our body utilize salt, whether we're consuming it or whether, let's say, we do like a salt float or something? How does it get absorbed through the skin versus uh, ingesting it? So ingest, uh, we'll start with the, with the salt bath first. You know, I'm a huge fan of salt baths. Um, I love sitting in salt. You can sit in a, a, a pool of salt. You can actually float in salt. Um, and there's some good research on temperature therapy. You know, if you sit in, in, you know, in hot water, it loosens muscles and it has some, some benefits there. Um, and if you ever swam in the ocean, it feels really good on your skin. Um, as far as like full, uh, transdermal absorption, there's very little research that would suggest that happens on a, on a, on a, on a big scale, if at all. Um, we know it's great for the skin. It's a natural cleanser. And so for topically, you know, for, for, you know, removing surface dirt and oils and for helping tone the skin, you know, salt has a lot of applications. Um, you can make a little salt and clay facial mask and it really does a great job in, you know, lifting out oils and, and helping clean and purify the skin, but not a lot of trans uh, transdermal absorption of, of salt has been, has, has been studied up to this point. So now internally salt has a lot of, of functions. It does, you know, we talked about balancing intercellular and extracellular fluids, which is why when you go to the hospital, the first thing you do is you get an IV of saline solution and that the, the two primary solutions you'll get in the hospital. The first one is just called, normal saline. It's 0.9% sodium chloride. The other one that's pretty typical is called the lactated ringers. In lactated ringers, it's predominantly sodium chloride, but then you've also got potassium chloride, magnesium chloride, um, and potassium chloride that are with that IV because in our cells, we have something called the sodium potassium pump, and that helps. Um, you, you need both of those electrolytes to help balance that fluid. But salt is also essential in stabilizing heartbeats and, you know, stopping cramps and muscles in, in the gym. You'll really notice that a lot um, when our salt levels start to drop because salt is so essential and the body regulates that so carefully. When our bodies start to drop in salt, eventually we would end up dying with something called hyponatremia. Unfortunately, it seems like every year or so we hear stories of either a football team or a military squad in either, you know, California or Texas, and they're out running in the sun, they're drinking lots of water, but yet they're forgetting the salts with that. And so then one of them will either pass out and, and even occasionally we've had deaths that are linked to, to water consumption in hot areas without the balancing of the electrolytes. And so you know, outside of a spiritual discussion, the only difference in the three of us visiting one minute and then me being dead the next minute, outside of a spiritual discussion, is the absence of an electric current. My heart beats because of electricity. My hand moves because an electric current from my mind, you know, radiates down my arm and tells my muscles to fire. And so our bodies absolutely have to conduct electricity. And so distilled water is a very poor conductor of electricity. And as our, you know, if, even if you drink distilled water, when you urinate or cry or you sweat, you're not sweating distilled water. We're sweating salts and we're flushing those out of our bodies. So if we went to the hospital and got an IV, an IV of anything but salt water would be deadly. You know, you're not going to get an IV of distilled water. You're not going to get an IV of tap water. You're not going to get an IV of coffee, although some people might want that. They think they want that in the morning. I would love that. The, uh, <laughs> me too. <laughs> um, but the IV has to be saline solution, which is 0.9% sodium chloride, or it's the lactated ringers that has the other minerals that help offset that sodium. And so it's, um, you know, also one, one thing that's kind of overlooked in salt is it's vital for absorption of food particles in our stomachs. You know, our stomachs digest food using hydrochloric acid, but nobody, none of us drink hydrochloric acid. Our bodies create that. 
but we have to give it the building blocks to create that. Now, hydrochloric acid is, is HCl. So you got hydrogen and you have chloride. And you don't just get chloride from nowhere. We get the, we eat sodium chloride, we eat salt. The body through electrolysis breaks down the sodium and chloride. The sodium is used in the sodium potassium pump and in a few other body systems. And then the chloride is used to make hydrochloric acid that's then helpful for indigestion. So when you talk to somebody that, you know, switches to a low salt diet because they heard salt's bad for them, one of the first thing that ends up happening is they get indigestion because they can't digest their food as well because salt is essential for for helping regulate um, our digestion. So it's used in so many processes and parts of the body that often get overlooked. Mm, wow. It's interesting that you mentioned hyponatremia. We're actually going to have Professor Timothy Noakes on our show um, here in a few weeks, and he wrote a book called Waterlogged that's all about that. And it's funny because so many people in the fitness world or you know, even people that we consult with who come to us and we ask them what their goals are and what they want to try to improve, almost everybody knows that they need to drink more water. But oftentimes we kind of have to point out to them that you actually might be drinking way too much water and you're not getting enough salt. You're not holding that water inside the body. And that's why the body's thirsty. Do you agree with that? A hundred percent. You know, there's a lot of different books on how much water you should consume. And I think there's probably, you know, like many topics, there's, there's probably experts on both sides that have high amounts or lower amounts. Um, personally, I've, I've liked the, you know, there's a Dr. Batman yell, he's passed away now, but he wrote a book years ago called your body's many cries for water. And he talked about the importance of water. You know, all of us know that dehydration is bad. Now, how much water we should consume, there's, uh, there's some discussion there, but I think the, the more important part of that discussion is the salt and the electrolytes that are attached to that water. If we look at animals, you know, animals in nature, they don't overdose on salt and they don't overdose on water. You know, if you watch the deer, for instance, and what they do is they drink water and they eat enough salt. They'll find salt in the soil. They'll eat salt to help balance out the amount of water they need. And so if you're in the hospital and you're hooked up to an IV of salt water, saline solution, you can't actually overdose on saline solution. I mean, you might need a catheter if you're, if you're pumping a lot of fluids, but you're not going to overdose on saline solution because it actually balances the body out. And if you take saline solution and you rinse it in your eyes, there's no sensation. Distilled water really burns your eyes. Tap water will really burn your eyes. If you happen to breathe or, you know, put, um, you rinse your nasal cavity with distilled water, it'll burn, but you can rinse your nasal cavity with saline and there's no sensation and an IV of anything but saline solution will actually burn in your arm, where if you get saline solution, there's no sensation of the IV entering your body. And so more important than just the amount of water we should be consuming is consuming enough water for ourselves, but also having the salts to offset that. And I like the idea of about half your body weight in ounces, as long as you're getting enough salt to offset that. Um, if you drink, you know, I've got, I used to have a friend in high school. He used to love to just, you know, drink gallons of water a day. He'd always pack around this gallon pitcher of water or this gallon milk, this milk jug that he filled with water, which is fine. But if you don't replace those salts, you're just flushing salt all the time out of your body. And we, we absolutely have to have to have both. Mm. Wow. That's very well explained. I kind of have a two part question. The first part would be what, what would somebody notice day to day signs and symptoms and things like that, that they're not getting enough salt just as, as a day-to-day -day thing. And then the second part of the question is what are some more of the serious outcomes that can happen in chronically if somebody's not getting enough salt for a very long time? So the first thing, you know, very similar to the symptoms you might have with what we associate as dehydration. And so irritability, you know, these are some early signs of dehydration and low salt, irritability, headaches, muscle cramps, um, nauseous, you know, if you, if you're out, you know, enjoying your camping, you're hiking, you're, you know, skiing, whatever with a friend and they're feeling, you know, quite nauseous and they've got headaches, low salt is a very likely um, thing to happen because you're sweating, you're working out, you're in the sun and headaches and nauseousness and irritability are some of the first things that start to show up, um, 
in, in low salt situations. And it's easy to solve with a quarter, you know, a teaspoon, a pinch of salt under your tongue, a big glass of water. You'll know pretty quick um, if that's, if that was the problem. Um, now, longer term, things that really start to happen is actually there's a lot of studies now that show long-term low salt actually is linked to insulin resistance. And we know there's tons of problems when insulin resistance uh, starts to take place. And low salt has actually been linked, linked to that. Um, and then when that happens, we think we're, we're craving more sugars or carbs, which we aren't. We're actually needing, needing more salt. We work with a lot of low carbohydrate diets with our people and we notice immediately that people get really thirsty and they do start craving more salty foods. And you mentioned insulin resistance. I think that's so critical to understand that if somebody is confusing carbohydrate cravings, sugar cravings against salt cravings, and they're not getting enough salt, but they're getting way too much sugar, that insulin is what's keeping everything in. And once you drop that insulin down, you actually need to replace a lot more of the salt as your body's going to be dumping it a little bit more. Is that correct? You're absolutely correct. So a couple of things that I do at my house is I've got a dish of coarse salt crystals on my kitchen counter, about the size of a peppercorn. And when I'm walking past, occasionally I'll take one of those little salt crystals and I'll just suck on it. And I notice oftentimes that that salt crystal is quite sweet. If that salt crystal is sweet, it's telling me, one, I'm probably low on salt. And two, what happens is that actually if I'm having a craving um, or maybe I'm doing some intermittent fasting, which I like to do, a little piece of salt, it doesn't you know, break the fast, but it does uh, lower the, the hunger pains. Um, in fact, oftentimes I'll find if I've got you know, a coffee in the morning, and then I'll suck on a couple salt crystals. I don't even realize I haven't eaten until three or four in the afternoon. Um, and so it really can help with that, that intermittent fasting as well as kind of that keto um, lifestyle. You know, what, what's interesting as you probably work with a lot of your clients is there something that's kind of known as the keto flu. And so when people, you know, kind of switch over to that, you know, keto diet, you know, they notice they get headaches, they get nauseous, they have low energy when, when somebody switches, you know, they're burning through glycogen. So we have these glycogen stories, uh, stores in our body and water, one gram of glycogen usually attaches to two to three grams of water. And so as we're, you know, burning through those glycogen story uh, stores, as we're going into either a keto situation or even fasting situation, as those glycogen levels start to drop over the first, you know, 24 hours or so, our bodies are flushing a lot of water, two to three grams of water per, per gram of glycogen. But that water that we're losing isn't just distilled water. That water is also sodium chloride, potassium chloride, magnesium chloride, these other electrolytes that are in our intercellular and extracellular fluids. And so as those, those water levels drop because of the glycogen decreasing, we've got to replace that water, but we have to replace the salts too, or we start getting the headaches, those flu-like symptoms that we attribute to the keto flu, which really is oftentimes linked to either the body craving sugar or the dehydration that's accompanying those loss of fluids in that first, you know, 24 to 48 hours. That's so fascinating. I, I suffer with um, an, kind of an autoimmune issue called Raynaud's syndrome, where essentially I don't get great circulation down through my forearms and hands and same with my feet. Um, and when that gets kind of bad during the day, the only fix because I refuse to take medicine for it would be to do a little like teaspoon of salt chase with a little bit of spring water and it's crazy what that does for full body circulation. I have started implementing it with some workouts also, and the pump is so much better. And I just feel like I can maintain more of like a natural, uh, better resting body temperature than I, I could without salt. You know, Bethany, that's interesting. My wife uh, also struggles with some mild rain outs. And once her fingertips start to go white because of that poor circulation, it's really hard to get that back, as you probably know. Um, but a little teaspoon of salt and, um, you know, a big glass of water makes a big difference there. 
So you mentioned we've we've kind of talked about it's it's really very difficult to overdose on salt. I think a really interesting thing is the taste regulation. When we, when we're talking about carbohydrates, you can always have more sugar and always want more sugar because your body wants to reward you because sugar shouldn't be around all the time. Maybe seasonally, you know, maybe every now and again you find some something that's sweet and that's fine and the body rewards you by liking that sweetness and you can have more and more and more and there's no self-regulation. But I also notice with salt, there is self-regulation. I can eat something that's really salty and it'll taste really good until it gets to this point where it's just like overly salty and I can't take another bite. You know, I think if we all did a little bit more intentional eating and intentional living for that matter, we would all be a lot happier and a lot healthier. And I think, you know, if you watch animals, you know, animals are very intentional eaters. You know, if you have a, if you have a horse, um, you know, horses will, as they're out grazing, they will go through and pick out very specific plants that their bodies need. And they will get, they will eat ground that has minerals in it. Um, and yet somehow, because we have this instant access to all of this food, we as humans, you know, I don't think we've done as, as good a job listening to our bodies talk. And so as we get more intentional about, Hey, I'm going to eat this cucumber. How does it make me feel? You know, did it, did it make me feel better? I'm going to eat this big Snickers bar. You know, do I feel better or worse after that? And I think as we start to listen to our bodies, we'll actually end up with a lot better food choices and then maybe even kind of reprogram our bodies to realize that when we're craving a, a French fry, you know, we're not craving French fries. We're actually craving the salt that that French fry is attached to. And if we are needing some fiber, you know, we're, we're going to find better fiber than a processed starchy, you know, processed food. Mm, that's such a great point. Wow. We've learned a lot about salt already. Let's talk about the types of salt. What, what should we be looking for when we're trying to choose a type of salt to use? So I think there's three questions that everybody should ask when it comes down to finding the great, the great salt. You know, obviously having a little bias because we've got this, you know, great ancient seabed deposit that was serendipitously under my grandfather's farm in central Utah. So I'm a little biased, but there, a other, there are other good salt products out there and there's other great foods out there. And I think if we ask ourselves three questions, we'll find a great healthy salt and we'll also find great healthy food. Now, years ago, if I were to ask a group, hey, who has heard that sea salt is better? Almost everybody had raised their hand. They, 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 you know, and maybe 40 years ago, that might have been the case. If you went to a health food store or a, or a grocery store and bought a product called sea salt, it may have been better. The challenge is that's no longer the case. So as a listener, if, if you pick out nothing else from the discussion today, just know that you should not just look at a label and because it says sea salt, assume that it's better because your, your sea salt might be C grade. <laughs> um, so there's three questions. So the first one is know who's producing it. You know, today, often our food passes through many hands and it gets really hard to know exactly where that food came from. So if you walk into a big box uh, store and you buy a uh, bag of potatoes, you may or may not know who's actually producing those. And if you can find out who actually produced the potatoes or who actually produced the kale chips or who actually raised the salmon um, or caught the salmon, you're going to get better food choices. So the first is know who's producing it. And the second one is know the source. And it's really hard to know the source unless you know who's producing it. But if you know that this this fishing crew up in Alaska goes out and wild harvest this Alaskan salmon, then it's going to be really no, it's going to be a lot easier to find out where that's coming from. Is it coming from a, you know, the sea of Japan right after a nuclear meltdown? Is it coming from a, you know, really cleaner part of the ocean? So those are good questions I think we should always ask. So first is who's producing it. The second is know the source, exactly where that food is raised or grown or harvested or foraged or whatever. And then the last question is, what are they doing to it? Are they taking anything out? Are they putting anything in? And I think if you ask yourself those three questions, you're going to find a better, a better salt. And I think you're going to find a better uh, kale chip. And I think you're going to find a better salmon and a better egg. And, and I think it's maybe overly utopian to think that every time we eat something, we're going to be able to go to this level of really, you know, connecting with our food. 
But the more often we can, I think we're going to get better food choices. Mm. Well, we wanted to speak with you specifically. We have no affiliation with Redmond, but we use your products and we love them. And it's funny, almost all of our clients use your products as well, but it, but there's kind of like two groups. There's the health people group and they could just eat anything regardless of taste and they'll just <laughs> choose the healthiest thing. And then we've got this other group of people that maybe they're not so much into health, but they love to cook and they love flavor and taste and they choose it because of that. So settle the score, which one of these two groups is right? <laughs> Well, <laughs> that's like the old beer commercial, less filling tastes great. <laughs> um, you know, I think both of them are right. And the, the reason that they're both right is because, first off, let's look at the group, the health food group. You know, we know that food that's nutrient dense is better for us, but that doesn't mean that food has to taste terrible. And although there are some foods that are good for us that do taste terrible, salt doesn't have to be one of those. Um, and then, you know, I mentioned earlier these two processes that most salts undergo. And the first one is the demineralization. And the second is the addition of chemicals to help um, regulate the way the salt interacts with moisture. So when you take away those other trace minerals that offset the sodium, it makes the salt quite bitter. And then you add other chemicals to it to stop its ability to retain moisture. And those are also bitter. And then you actually add there's um, other things we could have a discussion on iodine here in a second, but iodine is often added to salt and that has a flavor. And then because of that, there's other stabilizing chemicals that then are added to make this, this new chemical version of salt shell stable. So it doesn't turn yellow and look funny when it comes out of the shaker. And so when you add those chemicals to it, not only do you change the health aspect, which is why we get this health following, um, and, and why people in health food stores and in fitness coaches and, and uh, nutritionists all recommend this by brand. But then you also have the chefs that love it because when you don't add all that other stuff to salt, the salt has this natural sweetness that is often masked when you have the more processed version. So I think, I think both are right, which I think is okay. <laughs> We're okay with it. It tastes great. And we love it. Um, you mentioned sea salt is, is your real salt is sea salt technically, but since it's been dried, it's been preserved to the point that you're right. It's not getting toxic and mixed in with other things in the ocean. Is that correct? Yeah. So all salt today, that's, you know, all table salt or salt we would use on our, on our kitchens can be defined as sea salt because it comes from a seabed at some point. It might come from the San Francisco Bay, the Gulf of Mexico, the sea of Japan, the Mediterranean, it, but it's coming from a current ocean. That's one option. Or it could come from a dead sea, like the Dead Sea in Israel or the Great Salt Lake here in Utah, which I wouldn't recommend because neither of those bodies of salt water are, are very clean at all. In fact, Great Salt Lake is one of the most polluted bodies of water because of the industry over the years, not so much now, but years ago, the industry that just kind of dumped and flushed um, into, the, into the Great Salt Lake and into the Dead Sea. And then you also have the ancient seabeds. So, you know, the seabeds that were laid down eons ago, and, but, but the seabed is consistent in all of those. It's just, is it a current ocean? Is it a, a dead sea or is it an ancient sea? But, but the sea is consistent in all of those. And then from then it's just, you know, what are they doing to it? Are they putting anything in? Are they taking anything out? Um, and by reading labels and not just looking for buzzwords, we'll find a lot better food choices. And the same thing is with you know, with keto, there's a lot of, you know, products on the market now that may, they may say keto, but I'm not sure that just because it says keto on the package, that means we should be eating it. We, and I think the same thing is with salt. It could say, you know, healthy salt, but unless you look at the label and ask a few follow-up questions, I, I wouldn't recommend it. Yeah. We talked with Amy Berger recently and talked about, um, keto slim fast. <laughs> and I don't, I think we lost slim fast as a potential sponsor for our show, but, uh, I hate to break it to you. I don't think keto slim fast is going to be very healthy for you. Um, you did mention iodine. Let's, let's touch on that for a second. Um, what is iodized salt? So iodine is a really, as you know, as a nutritionist and as a health coach, iodine is an extremely important nutrient. And unfortunately, many people today are iodine deficient. Now, the way iodine got attached to salt is a very unique story. We have to go back to World War I. 
So in World War One, again, now we're, we have a lot of people that are eating more of a, a Western diet, eating a lot more processed flour, processed sugars, and in the Midwest particularly, not getting a lot of natural seafood and, and foods rich in iodine. And so during World War One, the military noticed that a lot of the men being drafted out of the Midwest had a goiter problem, and goiter is a sign of iodine deficiency. And so a lot of experts got together and said, hey, look, we need to stop this iodine deficiency. And I don't know exactly what that discussion looked like. I would hope that somebody along the way said, hey, let's have a campaign that says eat more iodine rich foods. That's maybe they may have had that discussion, but that wasn't the result as a that wasn't the final solution. What they came up with is finding a food that they could add potassium iodide to to compel or force people to eat more iodine. And they tried to add it to a few other things. They added it to flour. It wasn't a great uh, dough conditioner, so it didn't really work in flour. What they ended up with was adding iodine to salt. Because salt is essential for life, everybody has to eat it or you will die of hyponatremia. And so what they said was any salt company that does not add uh, potassium iodide to their salt from here on out has to put a warning on their salt shaker that says, warning, this salt does not supply iodide, a necessary nutrient. Now, there is trace amounts of iodine in natural salt, but it's not 45% per quarter teaspoon of your daily recommended allowance of iodine. Now, it actually solved the problem because people were eating very little iodine. They added iodine to salt, potassium iodide to salt. And if you add enough of it, sure enough, it does actually help um, stop that goiter problem. So it actually worked. The challenge is now we've got a lot of other studies on iodine. And there was a great study that was written about in a book called Iodine, Why We Need It, Why We Can't Live Without It, written by a Dr. David Brownstein. And he illustrates in this study that less than 10% of the iodine that's added to iodized salt is bioavailable, meaning the iodine we're getting through salt is a very poor way to get iodine. Now, that doesn't mean iodine is not essential for life, and we shouldn't be going out of our way to get more iodine, just that salt is not and has never been the primary way we should get our iodine. Now, in natural salt, there is trace amounts of iodine. But it's not the, the levels you would get. But you wouldn't expect to get your levels of fat out of salt, nor your levels of protein out of salt, and you shouldn't expect to get your levels of iodine out of salt. And so by eating foods rich in iodine, kelp, seaweed, fish, dulse, um, you know, mozzarella cheese, there's other, there's a great, a lot of great websites that talk about foods that are rich in iodine. And even that might not be enough for some people because of other factors that block iodine reception. And so many people probably should consider a good iodine supplement, but that shouldn't be salt. So when exercising, sometimes it depends on the intensity and kind of what I'm doing, but sometimes I'll notice that I'm sweating and other times I'll notice that there's like a white kind of minerally line where I'm sweating. What is the difference there? Um, I, I, I mountain bike a lot. And uh, on my mountain bike backpack that I wear when I mountain bike, there's usually salt lines all the way around it. Um, cause as we're burning and, and exercising, we are flushing a lot of salt and that's why, you know, the product uh, Gatorade exists, right? It was to aid the Florida Gators. And so as the football team in Florida noticed on hot days, when they were sweating and losing all of these salts, they were getting muscle cramps, fatigue, nauseousness because of the low salt. And so they said, Hey, let's uh, add salt to water. And then we you know, to make it even prettier, let's add some food coloring and let's make it sweeter by adding some, you know, nasty high fructose corn syrups and sugars. And they created this product that became this, you know, sports drink all across the country. And the problem was, it, it, and it worked, right? Um, because it had this salt in there. The problem is it also has all these artificial colors and flavors and things that our bodies just don't need. And so to make your own sports drink for pennies on the dollar, take a quart of spring water or you know, your, your cleanest filtered water you can get, add a quarter teaspoon of real salt, the natural mineral salt. And then if you'd like to put a squeeze of lemon in there, or maybe a little honey for some energy, and you can make a sports drink that's way healthier and cost you pennies on the dollar compared to the pink and blue and hot fuchsia, you know, sports drinks that are full of sugar and all other kinds of stuff that your body doesn't need, but it does need, it does need the water and the salt. Mm. Why why is Redmond's real salt not actually just pure white? So 
pure white crystals, if you have just one sodium and one chloride molecule bound together, it's sodium and chloride. It binds one to one and it's a halite crystal. And when seawater occurs, though, as I mentioned before, seawater occurs with these other complex chlorides. And in this ancient seabed, the reason that the red mineral salt has kind of a rosy quartz or a pink color, is, and same with the Himalayan salt or the Bolivian uh, pink salt, is these ancient seabeds had other minerals that were trapped in, into that crystalline structure. So real salt is only about 98% sodium and chloride, which is that, that crystal, that uh, the more of the just white a halite crystal, and then there's 2% other minerals that are attached with it. Magnesium chloride, calcium chloride, iron, selenium, zinc. Same thing with the the uh, the Celtic, uh, the gray salt, the kind of a damp gray salt comes from the coast of Brittany, France, and that has a light gray color to it instead of pink, and that gray color is from the minerals that are in the clay-lined ponds where that salt settles off naturally. So when you're looking at a salt crystal, if you go to your kitchen cupboard and dump some salt on your hand, the salt crystals shouldn't look 100% beady and uniform and per perfectly matched. Salt in nature should be more like a snowflake and that every crystal should have its own unique shape and unique look. And that's one way to see, you know, if you're at a restaurant, you just throw some salt on your hand. Um, you know, if you're at a, you know, in your kitchen, you can throw some salt in your hand. And if it looks all these, you know, perfectly shaped, all beady crystals, you know, that's not the way nature created it. I've heard you tell this story before, and I think it's super interesting. So I'd love to hear you tell our listeners, how did real salt get started? You know, I, I mentioned at the very first of this podcast, how salt was always essential for early civilizations. And so all these early civilizations started around access to the salt deposits. And early, early man has watched animals and what they eat for years. And so in, um, as the West was getting settled and as the kind of the West pioneers were settling through Utah and then down through into Arizona, eventually into California, as they were coming through this central Utah area, they noticed this spot of ground that the Native Americans were actually using for salt. And there was this outcropping of salt that the Native Americans had harvested before the early pioneers had came into the valley. And the early, pine, the early Native Americans had watched the animals, and that's how they saw that this salt was there. And so my grandfather and his brother had a farm in this area, and just north and south of their farm, there was a little outcropping of salt that the early pioneers had noticed that the early Native Americans had harvested. In fact, in a lot of the, the Native American sites through central Utah and into even uh, New Mexico, like Mesa Verde and and the Fremont Indian State Park in Utah had these salt crystals that had came that had that had come from this spot in central Utah. And so north and south of their farm, there's this little outcropping of salt. In World War II, my grandfather was a riveter and then a business manager at McDonnell Douglas in California. And his brother was a miner at Kennecott, the big copper mine in Utah. So after the after the war was over, they were back together uh, farming as brothers and raising their families. And there was a drought in the 1950s that was really bad, took a real toll on the family farm, but they knew there was salt under their farm because of the outcropping north and south of their farm. So with the business experience of my grandpa and his brother's mining experience, they got a bulldozer and plowed the, plowed the, the, the oats and the alfalfa out of the way and, and started mining salt. And they hit salt about 30 feet from the surface. And initially, in the 1950s, mostly sold the salt for ice melt. Here in Utah, we have icy roads in this time of year. <laughs> At least we should if we get any snow this year. Yeah, seriously. Um, <laughs> so they, they would sell it for ice melt because it melts uh, very well on the roads. They'd also sell it for agricultural use. And then the family ate it themselves as food salt, and they noticed that it, it tasted great, but it had a funny look to it. You know, in the 1950s, all the salt was this processed white-looking salt, and their salt was this rosy you know, colored cords. And so they thought, well, this, I mean, we won't, we won't sell this as food salt, but it sure tastes better to us. And what was interesting is the cows would actually eat this salt from the, from this ancient seabed that eat the salt and they'd lick the ground that the salt was on before they would eat the processed salt blocks that were coming out of, you know, like the great salt Lake or, or out of, you know, Detroit and Chicago area, these processed salt blocks. Um, but it wasn't until the 1970s a nutritionist came through and as the health food movement was kind of taken off in the 19, early 1970s 
this nutritionist had come through and just fell in love with the salt, went home and wrote an article about how this salt from Utah was the, the tastiest and healthiest salt out there because of these minerals. And so we started getting these phone calls from around the country of people who had read this article about this tasty, healthy salt from Utah. And at first we thought they wanted it for their cows because you weren't really selling it for humans at that point, other than you know, to the family and the locals. And they said, no, we, we want to, we want to eat this. This is the best salt we've had. We want to have it in our health food stores. And, and so the family <laughs> sat around and said, what do we call this stuff? It's not just, you know, it's not processed salt. It's not sea salt. It's, it's just real salt. And the name stuck. <laughs> so it's been Redmond Real Salt ever since. And uh, now you can find it in a lot of health food stores. You can find it online. You can find it in some gyms and health spas. And we've taken it from that, you know, that original just real salt. And now we have other products that are kind of based around that. We do some seasoning salt, some rubs. Um, and then we actually take the salt and put a little bit of magnesium, calcium, potassium to up those other electrolytes. We add some stevia and uh, put it into a, a powder so you can make your own, you know, sports drink. If you don't want to, you know, make it yourself with the, the recipe I gave earlier, you can just put a little scoop of this and you get, you know, calcium, potassium, magnesium, sodium, a little bit of stevia, and, uh, and it's a sports drink. I vote for your next product to be that face mask you were talking about with the salt base and clay. You know, that is, uh, we do have some facial uh, products. It's under a brand called Redmond Clay, and it's just a, a clay and a water mat. And we have some that's got a little bit of charcoal and some cucumber extract in it. But, uh, and those are, those are fun. But when I make it myself, you know, when I was in high school and you get that kind of that teenage, um, you know, breakout face, you know, the uh, making my own face mask with, with salt powder and clay powder with a little bit of water really uh, made a big difference for me. Um, and I still do it occasionally, but not like it did back when I was in my uh, high school and wrestling days. And I was always getting oils and dirt and all kinds of, you know, stuff from the mat ground into my, my pores every day. That's awesome. I'm def definitely gonna have to give that a try. We're also big fans of the earth paste. Um, what made you guys decide to do a toothpaste? You know, growing up, um, I don't know if it was my dad was a genius or he was really cheap or maybe both. <laughs> But, uh, you know, when all you have is a hammer, everything starts looking like a nail, as they say. <laughs> and so, you know, growing up, we used salt and clay for a lot of things. And one of those things was tooth powder. And so we would take, you know, clay and salt and mix it together. And, and clay, it's alkaline. Um, you know, one of the main challenges with, uh, with dental, um, with, with cavities, is acidity. And so, you know, when we drink acidic um, maybe we drink coffee, we drink tea, it's very acidic, which is hard on enamel, or maybe we just eat some carbs or sugars. And in our mouth, we have these bacteria called Staphylococcus mutants that digest sugar. And as they digest sugar, they excrete lactic acid, which is acidic. And so our teeth, which are predominantly calcium phosphate, um, start to dissolve, which is the enamel starts to dissolve when it's in the presence of lactic acid or, you know, very acidic mouth. If it's, if it's under, and then when the mouth acidity drops below about 5.5, we'll start losing some of that hardness and some of that enamel in our mouth. And then it remineralizes once we, you know, bring that mouth, the alkalinity back up. So clay has a pH of about nine and a half. So it's quite alkaline. The reason that you might buy a toothpaste that has baking soda in it is because baking soda is alkaline. So dental companies, toothpaste companies will put baking soda in toothpaste to boost the alkalinity. So after you've eaten your breakfast, you've got some carbs in your mouth, you've got maybe some orange juice acidity in your mouth. When you brush with a sodium bicarbonate, which is alkaline, it boosts the alkalinity. And so it stops that acid erosion. And so clay is a natural uh, booster of alkalinity in the mouth. It's also a nice polisher. And then salt is a natural antiseptic. And so if you've had a mouse or a canker sore, or maybe you've had oral an oral extraction, the dentist will tell you to gargle with salt water because of the way it helps kill that bacteria. Mm. And so by having uh, salt, which is, you know, naturally works against um, some of that bacteria in the mouth, and actually salt has been shown to be very pro-gum. It helps your gum lines and, and very healthy for your gums. And then clay, you know, is that nice alkaline polisher. It's a great one-two punch, but uh, it's kind of, it tastes not so great. And, uh, and so we thought, well, maybe we could take the, that original formula, which is just kind of that salt and clay powder, 
And people have done that for years. You know, if you talk to your great, great grandparents, maybe they would brush their teeth with, you know, salt and baking soda or something. So it's not all that new. Um, but we took the, the base of the clay, which is alkaline. It's great polish. You added the salt as, uh, you know, kind of that antiseptic um, for the mouth. Add a couple drops of essential oil. And then uh, we have some that have xylitol that has some pro-dental impacts. And, um, and made a toothpaste out of it. And so now you can have this, uh, we call it the world's ugliest toothpaste. It looks like mud, but it has this uh, great um, polisher cleanser. I've used it for the last uh, about 15 years since we introduced it. And uh, I still love it every bit as much as today as I did 15 years ago. I have to shout out the tooth powder. I absolutely love it. So I feel like I was overbrushing before just trying to like almost scrub them clean, convert it over to baking soda. And that just kind of wasn't doing it. And I love, 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 especially the charcoal one, because not only is it so fun to look at yourself after your teeth are all black, <laughs> uh, but it feels like your teeth are, the polish is a perfect way to describe it, but it almost exfoliates like the space in between your teeth. I don't find as much of a need to do like a fluoride rinse or as much flossing even. And I definitely am not making my gums bleed anymore by brushing too hard. So it's, it is, it's just a great product. Yeah, so a couple of fun things, and there's that actually been some good studies on the differences in toothpaste and tooth powder. Um, and so with a toothpaste, you're always getting the same amount of abrasion because you, it's pre-mixed. With a tooth powder, um, clay particularly, and salt as well, you talked earlier, are both hygroscopic as well as, um, so, so clay is both adsorbs and absorbs. And so it, it actually draws like a sponge and actually pulls like a magnet. So when you put a dry powder in your mouth and now you're hydrating it with your saliva, it's actually binding and grabbing more stuff. And, and because you're brushing dry, it actually is a little more abrasive than if you're brushing with a wet product. And so for somebody with really sensitive teeth, they're actually probably want to avoid uh, tooth powders because tooth powders are a little more abrasive, but for somebody like me, or sounds like you as well, who don't struggle with really soft, uh, weak enamel, tooth powders feel amazing. And even if you don't do it every time doing it occasionally, the, because the, the clay and the salt are actively binding, it actually is, is drawing some of that, you know, the bits of food and an old saliva and bacteria that are stuck in between the teeth because you know, clay, just like it's drawing on your nose, which is why it kind of lifts off those dirt surface oils and things out of your pores, which is why you get a, a facial at spa, kind of works the same way in and around your teeth. So it's kind of a fun, a fun product. And it's easier to travel with. You don't have to worry about, you know, the liquids, your gels. Um, when you're camping, it's nice because you get your toothbrush wet, dip it in the powder and, and you're good to go. Well, we have learned so much about salt today. This has been an awesome discussion. We are going to ask you the million dollar question which is how much salt should people be consuming? That is the million dollar question. And when it's linked to the discussion we had earlier on our volume of water, um, that is, it's, it's critical that both of those discussions take place together. And so if you're eating a natural diet, our salt consumption is going to need to go way up compared to what it was before. You know, if we're eating processed foods, TV dinners, um, a lot of eating out, we are getting a lot of processed sodium in a lot of that food because it's natural preservative. But as we try to make a little more intentional choices and we're eating more fresh vegetables and fresh meats and, and just not eating out of cans, our levels of sodium are gonna drop quite a bit because we're not getting all that processed sodium in all of that food. And so what I suggest is if once somebody is trying to eat more intentional and eating more, more fresh and more, you know, less processed to salt your food liberally to taste food should taste good. And if we're drinking amounts of water and we're salting our food to taste, we're not going to overdose on salt at the table. Otherwise it would be too salty and you're going to quit doing that. Um, and then the other thing is when we're out working and we're burning through fluids, we need to keep in mind that we've either got to, you know, put a piece of salt under our tongue occasionally when we're having those cravings or start adding those electrolytes to the water that we're consuming while we're working out. And so I know it's not a real clear, straightforward answer, but I would say salt our food liberally and then add salt to our water or take salt in addition to the water that we're drinking because we do have to offset all of that sodium loss. 
That was very well explained, and it's our favorite answer. It might not be the one that people want to hear the most if they're looking for exact amounts, but it really does come to trusting your body, trusting your taste, and and I would just really highly encourage our listeners, if you feel like you get lightheaded sometimes, if you have headaches, if you get nauseous, if your energy is low, if your circulation is poor, if your body temperature is misregulated, try adding more salt and just see how you feel. It's, it's so amazing what it can do for us and how much we need it in our lives. Daryl, this has been an amazing conversation. Where can people go to find your products? And then where can people go to contact you if they have any questions? Yeah. So I'd like to start with actually a couple of great books. Um, you know, you mentioned uh, The Salt Fix by Dr. Dave or uh, Dr. Uh, James Dean Malcolm Antonio. That's a great book. Um, we're going to put some links to some articles here. Uh, that's a great way to learn a little bit more about salt and its impact versus sugar and how sugar and salt work together in our bodies. As far as the history of salt, I love the book called Salt, A World History. Um, really fun book that goes over, you know, how important salt has always been and some of those, you know, scenarios we talked about earlier. As far as finding Redmond products, you can find us at most health food stores, a lot of grocery stores, especially in the more the, in the West. And then, of course, you know, online, you can find it at realsalt.com for the salt side. If you go to Redmond, R-E-D-M-O-N-D, redmond.life, that's kind of our food products. Um, and you can find, you know, the salt and the toothpaste and the, the facial products there. Um, so hopefully that helps and uh, really appreciate, you know, both of your time today. It's been fun getting to know you a little bit better. And hopefully, um, you know, some of your listeners will have found this helpful and, uh, and if not, at least I've enjoyed visiting with both of you, uh, <laughs> Bethany and Casey. It's been an absolute honor. We're so grateful for you and for your work and for coming on to talk with us today. And our listeners are definitely going to get a lot out of this. Thank you so much. Daryl Bouchard, thank you very much uh, from Rural Salt, Redmond Drill Salt. We really appreciate you and your time today. Thank you. And this has been another episode of Boundless Body Radio. As always, thank you so very much for listening to Boundless Body Radio. It's really inspiring and amazing to see some of the reviews that we have been getting and also to receive so many messages and emails about how these episodes have improved our listeners' lives. And so thank you so very much. We are so happy to bring these episodes to you and provide them for free. And we really hope that they help you in your life. Uh, we have just passed two major milestones, which is absolutely mind-blowing to me. And basically we did both of these in pretty much the exact same day. We have just passed 100,000 downloads worldwide of Boundless Body Radio, and we have just launched our 250th episode, which is absolutely amazing. Like I said, I never imagined we could reach that many people. We always want to keep you updated on things that we're doing on our website. So if you go to myboundlessbody.com, you can always see what we're up to. This month, we have a link that you can go and schedule a functional movement screen, which we do virtually over Zoom. A functional movement screen is a series of seven different movements and three different clearing tests, which is designed to find weak links in the body, such as muscle imbalances and joint stability issues. It's a really great tool for discovering inefficient movement. And even if you're not experiencing pain in certain areas of your body, it's something that can prevent injury later on. Some muscles need to be stretched, some need to be strengthened, and we can help you create a plan around that so that you can stay healthy and continue to move well for the rest of your life. So again, you can go and schedule that at myboundlessbody.com. You will also see the other services that we offer. You can always schedule a complimentary 30 minute consultation with us to really chat about anything that you like. And remember, if you are enjoying Boundless Body Radio, please take a minute, give us a rating or review on Apple. It really helps get this passion project out to other people. And thank you again for tuning into Boundless Body Radio.